Good morning from Stockholm, Sweden. The local time is 9.30 a.m. Sunrise was about an hour and a half ago. The temperature is minus three degrees Celsius or 26 degrees Fahrenheit. And as you can see, it's just an absolutely spectacular morning. This entire walk is going to go for about three kilometers or two miles and we'll be focusing on historical aspects of the city as well as what you can do when you visit Stockholm yourself. So this tour begins in Gustav Aldorf Square, which is located just across from the Royal Palace. From the Gustav Aldorf statue, we're gonna walk past the Prime Minister's residence and the Swedish Parliament building before entering Gamlestan, which is the old city. From here, we'll visit two former palaces, which today are home to the Supreme Court of Sweden, as well as the House of Nobility, or what's left of Sweden's aristocracy. Next, we'll view from a distance the Ritterholmen Church, which holds the tombs of Swedish kings and queens before taking a walk down Stockholm's narrow medieval streets. After stopping by an old German church, we will explore the old German quarter, where we will catch a glimpse of Stockholm's tightest street. From there, we'll make our way back north, first stopping at a statue of the St. George slaying the dragon before visiting Stockholm's smallest public monument, Iron Boy. In our last stretch of today's walk, we're going to be visiting Stortorget or the Grand Square, the oldest public square in Gamlestan, where we won't be able to miss the Grand Noble Museum before ending our tour at Stockholm's Royal Palace. That's a lot to see, so let's get started. So Gustav Aldorf, he is the man whose statue is right here. He is one of Sweden's most significant kings. So he became the king in 1632 at the age of 16 and was immediately thrown into multiple wars with Denmark primarily, but also Poland and Russia. He rose to the occasion and today he's famous for his military career. So this statue is facing south towards the old town, which is just behind me. So the wealth brought to Sweden in the days of the empire meant the new construction completely filled Gamlestan and Stockholm expanded beyond the islands where we're standing right now. This is also where we can see the Swedish parliament and the royal palace. It's got the sun just behind it. The building I'm standing in front of is the Stockholm Opera House. The Royal Swedish Opera was founded by King Gustav III and its first performance was in 1773. The building wasn't open until 1782 and was replaced once again at the end of the 19th century. King Gustav III was regarded as the people's king as he brought lots of arts and culture into Stockholm. He also gave extra rights to the citizens. Sadly, he was assassinated outside the Opera House in 1792. He was assassinated by aristocratic conspirators who opposed his near absolute rule. The Opera House was closed and had a proper reopening in 1813. However, the building was demolished in 1892 and a new building was designed. Opera performances still take place regularly, so it's well worth checking the schedule before attending. And it's also really good to just try and have a sneak peek inside the foyer. It's beautiful inside. And now we're gonna to start to make our way towards the Prime Minister's residence. The building that we're gonna see straight in front of us right now is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Let me just find a place to cross the street. We will go this way. <laughs> it's the joy of doing these walking tours. So we are gonna see the Ministry of Foreign Affairs very soon. It was originally at the palace for the hereditary prince. The building is from 1651, but a lot of it was replaced in the 19th century. So let's keep on making our way towards the pedestrian crossing, and then we'll cross over and see the foreign affairs ministry. We're gonna cross right here. So just to give you a little bit about Stockholm, Sweden. So Stockholm is the capital of Sweden. The population within the city is 975,000, whereas if you count the entire urban area, the population is about 2.5 million. That is compared to Sweden's entire population of about 10.8 million. So here is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And now we're crossing over and making our way towards the Prime Minister's residence. Here you'll see that Stockholm is built across 14 islands and the lake that we see here is Lake Mullerin. Mullerin is a mixture of fresh water, fresh water and seawater that's coming in from the Baltic. You can see it also has very rapid currents. It is possible to go fishing in Lake Mullerin if you want. Uh, very popular to catch here is salmon. Salmon right from Stockholm city centre. So let's keep making our way across. Here you'll see the Swedish Parliament building. This building was built between 1895 and 1904. It's got a mixture of architectural styles, uh, in particular Corinthian style, 
neo-renaissance style and it has some roman features as well the design of the building is supposed to represent eternal power and strength so by using these greek and roman influences that sort of shows everlasting strength of sweden so let's keep walking along so coming up on the right hand side is going to be zaka skahusit the prime minister's residence now the name comes from a family a very famous family called the saga family who were one of the noble families here in sweden they owned the property until 1988 and it was the last palace in the city that was a private residence ever since 1995 the property has been the prime minister's residence uh, before then every time a prime minister was elected they would just live in their own home now i should say that sweden is a constitutional monarchy so there is a king king Carl gustav but he has no real power. He is purely representative. Uh, in the Swedish parliament, they have 349 members that are elected on four year terms. At the moment, there are 26 political parties represented in the parliament. So here is the Swedish prime minister's residence. It's this white building right here. The assassination of the Swedish Prime Minister created greater need for the Prime Ministers to be protected. The former Prime Minister Olaf Palm was shot on the 28th of February 1986 while he was walking home from a cinema with his wife Lisbeth in central Stockholm. He was the Prime Minister at the time of his death. The incident created a shockwave through the country which had previously perceived itself as being safe from such incidents. It was decided that greater protections were needed for the Prime Minister and the home was bought shortly after. You can see references to things like the assassination of Olaf Palm and the effect it had on Stockholm in books like the Millennium Trilogy, uh, like The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Now, as you can see, they are doing a lot of construction in this area as well. But if we were to go a little bit further down, we would see the Prime Minister's office. It's just behind the scaffolding that you see in the distance. So lucky him, doesn't have very far to get to work during the day. If you follow the free tours by foot self-guided walk of Stockholm, you will see it does extend a little bit further towards the statue of a homeless fox as well as the Prime Minister's office. But for us, we just can't see it today. <laughs> it's just a little bit too covered up with scaffolding. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue towards the Swedish Parliament. But how beautiful is this residence? And you can walk straight up to it. No one's there defending it at all. No police. And so now we're gonna make our way towards Riksbrunn. Riksbrunn which means sort of national bridge. So this bridge is designed to connect the prime minister's office with the parliament. It's going to be the building, uh, sorry, the bridge that's coming up on our left-hand side. So we'll here you'll see we'll cross Lake Mullerin and I'll give you a lovely view across the lake. You'll see it always has a very strong stream going down. So let's head across and take a little look. So with, from this lake, people tend to get a lot of their fresh water. It does supply this, most of the areas with fresh water. And when the lake is high, there is a system under the bridge that is designed to stop the lake from drowning, draining into the ocean. When the lake is low, the system keeps closes to keep salt from the Baltic out of the city's drinking water. So that's all underneath this bridge that we see right here. The bridge off in the distance is Norbro, North Bridge, and that is the oldest bridge uh, in Stockholm that still has its original stone arches. It's from around 1808. So let's keep on going. We're now going to make our way into Parliament House. Across the other side you can see the beautiful Ritter Holman Church, which is what we're heading to on this walk. So the huge building that we're about to start going through is the Swedish Parliament. Most of the building is neo-baroque and neoclassical, as I mentioned before. It also has Roman and Greek elements, as well as some neo-Renaissance elements. Let me give you a close-up look at the building. So Sweden has had a parliament ever since the early 16th century, but before the late 18th century, it only consisted of members of Sweden's nobility. A little fun fact is also about half of the parliament was made up of German merchants. When Stockholm was founded, it quickly became an important area for German trade. So it was very common to see Germans in the parliament. We'll talk more about the German settlement a little bit later. Uh, now, as I mentioned, there are 349 members and there are 26 political parties elected. The current party in government as of 2022 is the Social Democratic Party, <clears throat> but parties do not have a majority. They have to work together in something called a coalition. So you can visit Parliament House during the day where those guards are starting standing is the entrance for visitors 
It is possible to do guided tours on the weekends. In summer, they do have guided tours every single day. Um, it is worth noting, you should probably leave your bags at your hotel because they have lockers here. You can't take anything inside with you. So let's make our way through the Swedish Parliament building. The building to our right hand side is the main headquarters of the bank. The Swedish Bank, National Bank, is located in this building right here. It's a really nice modern extension at the top. So we're going to keep heading out and now we're crossing over onto an island called Stadsholmen, which sort of means place island. Names are not as fun when you translate them into English, um, but the island that we're heading on to was where the oldest settlement of Sweden was. Excuse me, of Stockholm. This is where the oldest settlement of Stockholm was. So Stockholm was founded in 1252 and it wasn't one of the oldest cities in Sweden that actually goes to places like Sigtuna, which is a very well-known Viking settlement. Uh, but it was decided to make Stockholm the capital because Sigtuna and other Viking settlements kept getting raided and people were fed up with always being raided. So the legend goes that they put a log into the Stockholm archipelago and they watched it drift. And wherever the log would end up is where they would found the new capital of Sweden. And so the log ended up here on Stadsholmen, the oldest settlement in Stockholm. The name Stockholm, Stock means log and Holm means island. So there you go. So now we're crossing on to Stadsholmen. And to our left hand side we'll see the Royal Palace. We will be coming there a little bit later in the tour. Towards the end of the tour we'll be passing the Royal Palace. We'll do a little circle of Stadsholmen. So there's a lot of construction taking place. They're saying they need to be renovated and modernized. And they're currently doing the members building, which is this building right here. It's kind of one of the downsides of coming here in winter. One of the upsides is, is that it's much quieter. If you have been to Gomlistan before, you will notice how quiet it is. Um, but secondly, we will go around. We'll take the scenic route. Um, but secondly, the prices here are a lot cheaper. This is actually one of the cheaper times to come to Stockholm because it's a very quiet time. So hotels are often cheaper. Some museums are even cheaper. But yes, you do have to deal with things like construction work and some places do just outright close in um, winter. So we have to take a little detour Normally we would take a pathway around the back of the members building, but it is unfortunately closed due to renovation. We just get to start to admire the old town. Okay, let's go this way. Let's see if we can make it this way. If not, through the magic power of editing we will cut <laughs> and we will find a different path to go. So we're currently making our way towards Ritter Holman Church, which is the church we saw um, a little bit earlier. And then we're going to look at some palaces along the way. So the pathway is saying we need to go towards the other side, but look, this is open. Nothing to worry about. <laughs> we'll just make our way down the end here and we're now going to see a couple palaces on our right hand side. Because in Sweden they used to have 82 nobles. 82 nobles. And the nobles all lived in palaces around Ridderholmen. Ooh, have a look at this. What a beautiful little courtyard. See, this is why detours aren't always a bad thing. You just get to see beautiful things like this. Look at this view. It's lovely. Okay, let's keep on going. I get very easily distracted at pretty little detours. So the building that we're now standing outside of, this is Bonda Palace, Bunda Palace. So this palace was built in the 1660s for Gustav Bunda, 
who had just been appointed the Lord Treasurer of Sweden. So it was very important for impressive Swedes to have impressive homes. So he built this house right here. This house was destined to leave a trail of disappointment. Bunda brought on two architects, Nicodemus Tesson the Elder and his rival, Jean de la Vallée. Bunda ultimately chose de la Vallée, disappointing Tesson, but still using his drawings. Bunda never saw it finished, he died while the construction was underway. His death meant that the architect was never paid. They had only ever had a verbal agreement, which was quite typical of the time, so the architect was never compensated. The house never brought Bunda's family much joy either. Their fortunes were in decline, so they had to rent out parts of the building to the city. In the 1730s, the city acquired the building and made it the city hall. Uh, today, it is home to the Supreme Court. So there it is, right there. And now we'll make our way towards the second building, which is, which is the House of the Nobles. So the House of the Nobles is the next building here with the lovely statue out the front. So this was built in 1641 on land that had originally been a farm. So the man that you see here is Axel Oxenstierna. These names are crazy. <laughs> and he owned most of the farmland. He is a very famous person in Sweden's history because he was the longest serving Lord High Chancellor, kind of like today's Prime Minister. So Sweden has had nobility since the late 1500s and in the days they were a very powerful force as I've been talking about. But today they're mostly just symbolic. This building is often open to the public throughout the day and from about 11 to 12. It's very short opening hours but if you want to see inside it is totally possible. So on the top you can see there's some Latin writing. This says following the wise courageous example of our predecessors. So here is the house of the nobles. And now if we turn around we will see Riddersholmen. Riddersholmen is right here. So you can head across and on this island which is called Riddersholmen which means sort of um Knights Island. This is where a lot of the noble palaces used to stand. Uh, today lots of these buildings are used by the state, so for example the state archives are located there. So here we go. We will stand right here and look at Ritterholmen from here because you have to cross a really busy freeway and it's very noisy. So this used to be owned by the Greyfriars Monastery, this island, uh, but the church is the only surviving part of the monastery. Ritterholmen's church, which is this big beautiful church you see right here, this is one of the oldest churches in Stockholm. It was originally built in the 13th century, but it was rebuilt a few times. So this has been a burial place for the Swedish monarchs from Gustavus Adolphus through to the 1950s. Uh, today it is only a burial site. There are no modern, um, there are no burials in there anymore. It's just a historical site. If you go inside the church, which I highly recommend, you will see all the coats of arms and emblems of the nobles and the monarchs who were buried inside this church. So the church is open in the summer months between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. and it does cost a little money to get in. If you take the Stockholm Pass, it is free. So there it is. And then if you walk to the other side of this island, you get a magnificent view of Stockholm City Hall. It's one of my favorite views. But that's Ritterholmen. Now we're gonna look around here. So the red building is where you can do a rooftop hike of Stockholm's old town which is kind of cool I've I've done it and I know a lot of people who have done it as well so you can go inside you pay a little bit of money and then the company have created a series of catwalks on the roofs so you can walk around the tops of the buildings and sort of learn about Stockholm from the top uh, this building is a 17th century building by S Simon de la Vallée who we have talked about and the building is facing away from the water which is quite unusual for buildings of its time so now we're going to enter into Gamlestan, and as we make our way into Gamlestan, I'll just tell you a little bit about the history of the area. So Gamlestan means old town in English, and for a very long time, this is where Stockholm was. So Stockholm only consisted of the island Gamlestan. Um, as the city grew, the population began to grow beyond the borders as well. If you want to just quickly see the entrance, this is where you can do the Stockholm um, skywalk or walk across the roofs of the buildings. Okay, anyway, let's keep on going. So, as I mentioned, Stockholm was founded in 1252 and this quickly became the oldest settlement. 
Very quickly, this area grew as an important base for trade, especially trade with German merchants due to the access to the Baltic Sea. So Gumlestan has a mix of North German architecture. Most of the buildings we'll see today are from the 1600s onwards, um, but many of these buildings have cellars that go back to medieval and the Middle Ages. So a lot of people are discovering their cellars might be from the 1300s or 1400s. People do live in Gumlestan today, about 2,000 people call Gumlestan home. And up until sort of the mid 20th century, this area had a reputation for being a bit of a slum. But the people who bought their houses in the 1970s are in luck because what used to be a very cheap place to live has now become a very expensive place to live. However, it's not super popular with everybody because it can be quite noisy here in the summer with all of the tourists visiting. This is where you'll typically find a lot of the hotels, museums, restaurants, cafes. So it can be quite noisy and a lot of the people who live here today have summer homes that they escape to when it gets too noisy. Now when you come to Gumlestan, the first street that you're probably going to walk down is Vosterlongarten, the western main street. It's now coming up on our right hand side. So this is where the city's western wall used to be. So the island of Gumlestan used to be surrounded by walls. All of the buildings to the right are on reclaimed land and around this area would have been a gate leading into the city. Any merchants coming in would have had to pay a toll. Uh, most of the medieval town is about 15 meters below our feet. If you want to see the street name, it is Vostolongoten, Western Main Street. Now we're not going to walk down there because today that's where you find all the kitschy souvenirs. Some of the restaurants there can be a little overpriced and misleading. Uh, so we don't want to go down the main touristy street. We want to take our way towards one of the most beautiful streets in Gomlestan, which is Prestgarten. So here we are on Prestgarten. This is also one of the oldest streets in the city. It still has its medieval shape and the name, as you can imagine, let me show you the street sign. The name means Priest Street. So if you look behind us, you will see that Priest Street narrows at its other end. See this narrow, dark little section? This kind of has a dark past. So that area used to be known as Hell, and that's where the city's executioner would live. So the executioner was a person who had been accused and sentenced for committing a horrible crime, for example, murder, and he had two choices. He could either be executed or he could become the city's executioner. So this was considered one of the worst jobs in Stockholm, and this little section was called hell because nobody ever wanted to go near here. It's where the executioner lived. But this part, <laughs> I know that's very dark. Uh, this part is where you'll find a lot of the beautiful medieval elements of the city. So here we go. Um, Ingmar Bergman is of course from Sweden and he did a lot of his city shots in this street, Prostgarten. He didn't like Vostalongarten because of how touristy it felt. So whenever he was doing his city shots, he would come here to Prostgarten. And here he would show sort of the big city. So we're gonna make our way down to the other end of Prostgarten. It, this street used to be home to the priests who worked at Storschecken. Oh, look at the sun, isn't that beautiful? And it's snowing a little bit. I think it's snow that's blowing off the buildings though, because it's a clear sky. Anyway, so the priests who, li who worked at Storschecken would live down here. And down the other end is another street, is another church, sorry, called the German church. So German priests would also live down here. There we go. Beautiful details and have a look at this view. Isn't this lovely? I love Gummelstan, especially in winter when there's no one else here. <laughs> you can get it all to yourselves. So we're gonna make our way down to the other end. And at the other end is gonna be a little surprise for us. So I'll just let you admire this view for a second. All of the beams at the top would have been where they had ropes and hooks to lift goods up into the sides of the buildings because staircases were often quite narrow. Uh, kind of like what you've seen in Amsterdam, maybe. They would lift goods in and then put them into the windows. 
can see it's like snowing down the street and the sun's hitting the snow. It's perfect. So we'll keep on walking down and always pay attention to side streets. You never know what you'll find. Just beautiful elements of the old town of Stockholm. Now we're coming down towards the end. There's a kid back there having a really hard time because he's, his father is trying to put him into more layers of clothing because it's a cold day and he's not having it. <laughs> so if you can hear that, that's what it is. All right, here we go. We are coming towards the corner and it's always important to keep a, an eye on your surroundings. Firstly, you'll never know when you'll see cute little gates like this. Gates that are maybe 200, 300 years old, but also Let's take a look at what's coming up on our left hand side. But for this, we have to look a little bit low in the ground. See this rune stone right here. On the corner of Proscotton and Cockbrinken, we have a rune stone. So, why? And also, you'll notice to the left is a cannon. So, when a lot of cannons were decommissioned, they used them as posts to stop horse carriage wheels bumping onto the sides of buildings. So this is what we call a rune stone, which is a memorial marker from the Viking times, the pre-Christian times. So here that you'll see it has writing around it, which is the Old Norse written language. It is descended from the Roman alphabet and it comes um, from before the Vikings. You'll see that a lot of the letters are vertical lines because they often had to carve runes into wood or stone. And by using vertical lines, it was a lot easier. So why is this runestone here? Um, I should tell you this runestone, it is um, made by two parents in memory of their son. So runestones aren't normally here. <laughs> you don't normally see them in the sides of buildings. The reason this was here, they think, is because the builder of this house, he needed some stone for his home. And a few hundred years after runestones had been quite common, he just took it from wherever he found it and put it into the side of his home. <laughs> so there you go. Let's keep making our way along Proscotton. So you always got to look around when you're walking here around Gumblestan. Uh, if you go to the Open Air Museum Sconson, which is the oldest open air museum in the world, you will see a lot of runestones as well that they've put up around the area. In Sweden, there are over 2,500 runestones still existing, the largest collection of any Nordic country. So now we're making our way towards the end, where we're going to end up at Tiske Brinken, or the German Slope. And yeah, a lot of these buildings are private residences today. It's beautiful with the snow coming down, even though it's a blue sky. I just want to reiterate, the clouds in the sky are not snow clouds. Well, maybe they are. I don't know where this is blowing from, but I love it. As you can see, there's not a lot of snow on the ground. There was a massive snowstorm here about three days ago. Um, but a lot of people come and clear the snow. They also put gravel down on the ground. And many of these streets are also heated with electric cables to prevent ice forming because it would just end in disaster for people. Now, you'll see here a lot of iron anchors. You see these ones here. And then you'll see the straight ones up on the side of the building. So these are used to hold the floorboards in. So it sort of shows you how many floors there are in the building. And the different shapes of the iron anchors corresponds with different periods in time. The straight ones are the oldest ones. They think they're from the 1400s. However, it's kind of hard to date buildings like this because we don't quite know if they are original from the 1400s or if they have been recycled a couple hundred years later. A lot of buildings would typically be torn down and then rebuilt, so it's quite common to see old elements on new buildings. It's all about recycling here in Scandinavia. Beautiful doors. And now we're coming down to Tiske Brinken, the German slope. So you might remember earlier on in this tour, I talked about how this was a German settlement. So down here we will find the German church. So the church was part of a parish set aside for the German expats in the 16th century. 
when Sweden became a Protestant country, it was important for different congregations and different groups of people to be able to attend church in their own language. So because of that, it's quite common to find, for example, the Finnish church, but also the German church. The development of Gamlestan is in large part thanks to a group of German merchants called the Hanseatic League, or the Hansa for short. They came from North German cities such as Lübeck, Bremen and Hamburg, and traded in over 300 places across Europe, mostly on the Baltic Sea. They were most active between the years 1200 and 1500. Uh, shortly after the establishment of Stockholm as a city, a group of German merchants settled here. The power of the Hanseatic League died out in Europe in the 16th century, but the German merchants remained in Gamlestan around the German church area for a couple hundred years after that. On this walk, we will see influence of their power in Stockholm. But if we look up, we will see the German church. So the German church is dedicated to St. Gertrude, who is the patron saint of travellers, which could maybe include, you know, merchants, traders. And if you go inside the church, it is open throughout the summer. You can see a model of her. Now, there are gargoyles on top of the church, which is not super common in Sweden to see gargoyles. This building, it is from the 16th century, but it has been rebuilt in the 19th century after a fire. Otherwise, the church is still active. Above the gate, you will see some golden text, and this says in German, Fear God, Honor the King. Okay, so now we're going to continue to make our way down to Postgarten. So, this is a beautiful street to keep wandering down. So now we're heading through the German quarters. So this would have been where the German merchant lives. And we're heading towards the Tiske Stallplan, which is the old German stables. Along here, we will start to see a school that's associated with one of the old churches here in Gamlestan. Um, just a word of warning, do not photograph the children at the school. Um, they've had a lot of issues in recent years of the kids at the school being photographed by tourists. And in fact, one of the first phrases they learn in English is no pictures because they get photographed all the time. So just make sure you don't do that. Here is the school. All the kids are in at the moment, I think. Now we're heading down to the old German stables. Hopefully you can hear the church bells. It's beautiful. That's the German church. So, this is the old German quarter, as I've mentioned. Before the end of the playground, we are going to look for number 74. So pay attention. So we should see iron anchors here. Yes, this is gonna be a good example of the iron anchors. It's this yellow building coming up. So you can see these beautiful curvy iron anchors and then on the building, some of the anchors have the date. So it's really easy sometimes to be a tour guide because a lot of the buildings just put the date on the side. <laughs> It's very handy. Okay, so here, and I've mentioned this already on Proscotton, but we'll mention it here again. So the metal rod is running through the wall and under the floor, and it's keeping the floors from sort of bowing and starting to collapse into themselves. And yeah, different shapes mean different periods. The curvy ones should be the 1600s. Um, and even though the date does say 1630, you never quite know how many times the building has been redone on the outside. Here it is. So Tiska Storplan is located right here, and this used to also be part of the Blackfriars Monastery. However, most of the monastery was torn down when Stockholm became Protestant, and it was given to the Germans to be used as a stables. So the stables um, is best represented today. As you can see, there is nothing here that indicates stables used to be here, um, except for this one statue of a boy getting onto a horse. I'll show you the statue from the front. So this is the only memory of this area being used as a stables. There we are. So now before we head down, I'm just going to show you the narrowest street in the city. It is about 90 centimeters wide. It's just in the corner here. Hold your breath. This is the narrowest street in Stockholm. It's called Martin Trotzig's Grand, Martin Trotzig's Walkway. 
It's named after a very influential German merchant who emigrated here to Sweden. He then ended up buying many of the buildings along this street. And this is one of the old alleyways between his buildings. So here it is. You can go all the way down. It is a two-way street. We will not go down it today. <laughs> that just gives you a nice little view. We're going to keep going towards the left. We're going to finish Prostgarten all the way to the end. Oh, before we go, I should show you. Just one more look at the German stables area with the German church in the background and the German quarter. Today, a school. Cool, let's go. Hope you're enjoying this walk so far. We're almost getting around towards the Royal Palace. It's coming up very soon, don't you worry. I know you're all holding out for it, even though Gummelstein is absolutely beautiful. We've got old coats of arms of different families and merchants who would have lived here. This is just a way of showing who's in this building. Alrighty, so now we're going to head down to the end of this street. I'm just watching my feet a little bit because it's very icy. And cobblestone and ice are not the best of friends, <laughs> so we just have to watch where we're going just a little bit. We've made it down and then if I turn around and look over here you'll see a black door and I know I've shown you a lot of these black doors on the tour but this one's quite important this leads into the surviving cellars of the Blackfriars Monastery and if you go to the Museum of the Middle Ages yeah sometimes they do guided tours in here so you can only access it through guided tour so here it is and it's always worth looking out for these signs on the sides of the buildings well our self-guided walks are quite useful it's always good for a bit of extra information so here they're mentioning how this was given to the Blackfriars monastery and this area was likely a hostel for pilgrims but now we're just going to turn right and come and look at this square which is called yarn target or the iron square so let's come and take a little look down here So Jan Torget means iron square. This is the second oldest square in Stockholm. And this may shock you, but this is where the iron was treated. <laughs> Again, translating names here is so helpful as a tour guide. So this was a square where they would trade iron and Sweden's always been known as a big exporter of iron goods. Um, you'll see in the middle, there's a big pile of Christmas trees. And that's because all the locals here who've had a Christmas tree, they can leave it here and then a truck will come and collect it all. So there you go. But now, let me just turn around. Because here we'll see one of the old banks. So this is one of the oldest banks in Stockholm. It is actually one of the oldest banks in Sweden. It has been here since the 17th century and it used the building up until quite recently when they then moved. Um, now it is not an active building. So now we're going to walk along these buildings and we're on a street now called Östelånggatan. So we began on Västlånggatan, the western main street, and now we're on Östelånggatan. Östelånggatan is the eastern main street. So this is where the city's eastern wall would have been and all of the buildings that are on the right hand side are built on pillars about six meters into reclaimed land. So let's follow the Eastern Main Street. But first, I just want to point out this building here on the right. This is the Nyilna Freden, the golden piece. And this is the second oldest restaurant in the world that has never changed appearance. It opened in 1722 and it hasn't changed since then. <laughs> um, it's now owned by the Swedish Nobel Academy who have their luncheons here every Thursday. Otherwise, it is also open as a regular restaurant to us. Very beautiful restaurant. Here it is, the Nildena Freden. Unchanged since 1722. I think the menu has changed a little bit and the cooking materials. So let's head up. 
we're making our way up along the eastern wall. Now, we often get asked, where are the walls today? Well, they don't actually know that the walls are here. The walls haven't been found. They just think, looking at old pictures, that the walls, and of course the street names, that the walls would have been in this area. Um, all the medieval cellars are of course part of people's private homes today, so it's very difficult to see them uh, for people who are visiting Stockholm. We're turning on to Svartmangarten, which means Black Man Street, and this street again refers to the Black Friars Monastery that used to be here. So let's keep on heading down. This street down here, Borgensgarten, this would have been the red light district. This is the red light district. Not today. <laughs> But of course, you can imagine this was a sailor city. This was a merchant city. So there was this activity happening down here. Also down here is the apartment where two members of ABBA uh, got their start, where they first lived together. They just lived in an apartment down there. So it's the birthplace of ABBA, in a way. Let's keep on heading down. We all know ABBA. It's so interesting explaining that street. It has two very different sides of history. So we're now leading our way into a public square. And the word cluster means monastery. So you see references to the monastery everywhere you walk in Stockholm. So here we have the Jewish Museum. So this is the third um, in its location since it was founded in 1987, the first third building the Jewish Museum has been in. So in 1795, part of the building was home to the Jewish community. It had a synagogue, a school, residences for the rabbi, and it was a source of kosher food. So the law in Sweden until 1838 regarded Jewish residents of Sweden as their own separate nation. So in a way, this was kind of the Jewish capital. In the 1870s, the congregation moved out of the building and became a police station. Uh, they got to move back in in the 1980s. So inside the building, there are over 800 items, including the original pulpit, and they're trying to uncover all the original paintings where the synagogue used to be. The museum is open throughout the year and is available for free with the Stockholm Pass. They also do tours in English. So now we're making our way down a street called Schollegårdsgården. Try saying that ten times really fast. Schollegårdsgården. And at the end of this street we should come into a beautiful view of this very famous St. George and the Dragon. Let's keep on heading our way down. I'm just letting you take in the scenery, the stunning beauty of Stockholm's Gamlestan, the old town. Beautiful residential area, some very cold pigeons down here. <laughs> oh, it's so beautiful with the snow. The snow is falling so slowly. Let me stand here for a second. It's beautiful. All the signs on the walls. Always got to pay attention to these old signs. Uh, they're just saying it was part of the monastery in the 15th century. And then there were different businesses and shops here. There we go. Now it's a retirement home. Lucky them. Not a bad place to retire in my opinion. Although again, a lot of locals, they don't like being here in the summer. It's an interesting fox. <laughs> And then behind it, you can see an old map of Stockholm, and we're on the island to the left, just immediately to the right of the fox's face. The one all the way too far to the right, that's Jurgarden, which is where a lot of the museums are. Okay, so we're making our way down. This is a very pretty little square. Let me show you the restaurant that I'm just walking past. So cute. 
while there are a lot of places that can feel quite tourist trappy you do also find a lot of beautiful little cafes and bakeries here and you can see they're advertising the swedish american line which i assume is how a lot of swedes emigrated to the united states it's a really nice old poster so it's likely they had their headquarters in this area but we're going to keep making our way down here We're turning on to Schöpmangarten, which means the Merchant Street, really making it obvious what the past here used to be. Beautiful old building up here. And we're going to turn right here into Shopman Torget, the Merchant Square. can see the <clears throat> pardon me now we can see the really famous statue of Saint George and the dragon so this depicts Saint George slaying a dragon and this is a bronze copy of the original which is in Storshecken the old uh, church near the royal palace so the original statue was created by Bert Notke in 1489 to commemorate a military victory by Sweden against Denmark the monument portrays that battle as a moral fight against evil um, in the original legend of course Saint George killed a dragon that was demanding tribute in the form of sacrificial children and he did so just in time to save a princess <clears throat> pardon me in this tradition you can see her off to the side she's just there on the right um, but this has also been taken from a swedes perspective so while we all know the story of saint george and the dragon here the swedes also interpret it differently uh, they interpret the dragon as denmark and the little princess being rescued as sweden and then the man he represents one of the great swedish uh, fighters who fought in the many wars against Denmark. So it also has its own local interpretation. So now we're gonna walk along Schopmangarten, heading towards the main square, which is called Stortorget. So let's keep making our way down. As we go, you'll see the building on the right has many different types of wall anchors. So it's always good to pay attention to these sides of the buildings. Again, all depicting the different levels to secure the floorboards in. Um, if we go into Stefan Sosser's Grund, we can also see one of the oldest portals in the city. So let's go take a look at that. Here it is, right here. It's okay to go into places like this, you just got to be a little bit wary that people do live here as well. And people work here and they don't want loud tourists coming by all day. But let me show you the beautiful old portal. So here we'll see a rose portal, which is the oldest stone portal in the city from the late 16th century. There you go. The rose portal from the 16th century. Hidden away in someone's just office. Now we'll keep on heading down. Another beautiful detail above this building as well. Okay, let's keep on walking. And again, if you've been here in summer, you can really tell the difference, right? <laughs> in winter, it's so different. So we're just going to make our way along. We're looking for a street off to the side here. We're going to take the side streets to the main square. We don't take the main way. Here we go, Skepa Olaf's Grand. Here it is. Let me show you the street name. Beautiful. Would you live in this area? Sometimes I think I would live in this area, but then after hearing about what it's like in summer, maybe I don't want to live in this area. 
I just think it's so charming. I would love to have an office in this area. I think that would be nice. Would you mind the noise, the tourists? Maybe you'd find it part of the charm. So now we're coming into Trogod's Garden. I'll show you the street sign. So this is called Garden Street, and this is where the Royal Gardens used to be located. But now what we're going to see is the back of the Finnish church, or Finskesjöken, which has the small walled area to the right. We can also see the back of the church here. The building used to be a big ball game hall, uh, but today it is all used as the church. And I did mention them very briefly at the beginning, but much like the Germans, the Finns pay played a significant role in the beginning of Stockholm. Here's the church. Uh, they moved in their own circles where they could speak their own language, and Finland was also technically part of Sweden for a few hundred years. See, so we have the small back courtyard of Finskesjöken located right here. And here you'll see the smallest public monument in Stockholm. Can you see it? Maybe you saw it already. Here we have Iron Boy. Iron Boy. So it has a small statue of a boy with his arms around his knees. The artist, Lis Eriksson, created him in 1954. People tend to leave coins around him, as you can see. And they also dress him for the season, giving him a scarf and a hat when it's cold. No one's dressed him this season, though. <laughs> so let's keep on going. <coughs> Pardon me. I wasn't expecting it to be so snowy. The weather forecast said mostly sunny today. But I don't mind. <laughs> I don't mind if you don't mind, I'm sure you've all dressed warm for the occasion. Let's keep on walking down the garden street where the royal gardens used to be. That must mean we're getting close, right, to the palace. Surely that's what it means. Let's keep on walking. You can see it's starting to get very icy on the ground. Oh, it's some beautiful street art here. You don't see a lot of street art in Gumblestan, but I quite like this one. This is very cute. There you go. Keep on heading down the street. So, the most famous place in Stockholm is now going to be coming up. It's called Stortorget or the Big Square, and it is the oldest public square in Stockholm. In this area, the medieval town is only half a meter below our feet. So compared to other places which we've visited, which were maybe 15 meters below our feet, this area is only half a meter below our feet. So this in summer is often one of the most crowded places <laughs> in the whole city, but today it's nice and quiet. We get it just for us. So let's talk about a few buildings here. You can see the garbage truck has come just for us. <laughs> there's a police car here as well, there's a FedEx car, always something happening here. So, let's talk firstly about the Stock Exchange building. It was built in 1773 and the same architect designed the fountain in the middle that I'm going to show you in a second. Today this is home to the Swedish Noble Academy and it's also the Noble Museum. So it's where you can learn about all the Nobel Prize winners inside this building. So if I pan around to the right, we will see this lovely grey building. This building is as it was in the 17th century and today it has a uh, cafe and bakery. You can go inside. The bakery is owned by the Stockholm City Mission, which gives support to people who have fallen on hard times and need a little bit of assistance. So they own the grey building. And then they also have this adjacent building with a little um, bakery inside. You can see just there. Here is the fountain that was designed by the architect who did the Swedish Academy or the old stock exchange. And now we come to numbers 18 and 20, the red and yellow buildings, which are arguably the most famous buildings in all of Stockholm. So these are 17th century style buildings, though they think the red one goes back to no later than 1479. The one on the left houses a cafe, so you can go inside and take a look at the historic interior. Um, all the white stones around the windows 
uh, are said to symbolize the lives lost in the Stockholm bloodbath. This was when Sweden was ruled by the same king as Denmark, and the Danish king Christian II uh, came to Sweden to try and convince the people that King Christian II was a great guy and a great person to be the king. He invited between 80 and 100 nobles to dinner. He locked the doors and over three days he beheaded 82 to 100 nobles. He lay out all the heads in the square to, as a reminder to everyone to stay in line. Uh, king Christian II today is commonly referred to as Christian the Tyrant. And then, as we said, this is the Nobel Prize Museum, this building just here. So now we're going to walk along this square, making our way to the Royal Palace. Along the way, we will see a couple little fun things, though. The Nobel Museum. There it is once again. And now let's say goodbye to Store Target and make our way towards the end. In front of us we will see Storschecken, which is an old church from the 1300s. As you can see, unfortunately, it is under some renovation work at the moment, so we can't see too much of it. And there were some kids in Store Torget. I don't know if I got them on camera. They were taking photos of themselves being beheaded on the main square after what happened to King Christian II. Oh my gosh. Crazy. Okay. So, coming up here, you will see the Rix Telephone. Rix Telephone means National Telephone, and this is a vintage phone box that dates back to the mid-19th to late 20th century. And this was a way to sort of call between the cities before phones become a common thing. Here we go. So, these um, buildings, the current ones that we're looking at, are from the 1980s. There it is. Rix Telephone the state or the city um, phone. There's the entrance into Storschecken if you wish to go inside. So Storschecken means the big or the great church and this church has been here since 1306 though it has been rebuilt. A lot of the interior is still medieval but the exterior has changed throughout the years. This is where you'll find the wooden statue of Saint George and the dragon. Um, unfortunately the church is being renovated at the moment and the exterior, you have to take my word for it, we'll put a picture up on the screen, the exterior has a very Baroque style. And this renovation began in 2020 to restore the exterior. You can go in for free during the renovation and the prayers and are still going and the church is still active. Here is some information about Storschecken's renovation. That's what it looks like. And now we're coming up to the Royal Palace. So the Royal Palace is the official residence of the Swedish monarchy. Although they no longer live here, <coughs> excuse me, they no longer live here. They haven't lived here since the 1980s. It is built over the site of the original castle, which was built around the 13th century when Stockholm was founded. The original castle was called the Tre Krona Castle, or the Three Crown Castle, and it stood here until it was destroyed by fire in 1697. The new palace was completed in the 1750s and it hasn't changed much of its appearance from when it was constructed. Here it is. This is the Royal Palace. So it's a beautiful building. We're coming in through the western facade and we'll go into the Royal Courtyard that you see right here. Where a lot of the military are out and about today. Now, due to renovation work, we can't go to the finishing point for this tour. If you follow the free tours by foot self-guided tour, it does take you all the way down the stairs towards the Museum of Medieval Stockholm, which I highly recommend. Um, but unfortunately, as you can see, the pathway is blocked due to construction work. You can see all the military are heading off. Maybe they're changing, heading out for the day. You can see the changing of the guard here. It is not as regular as it is in Copenhagen, for example. Uh, the Royal Guards have guarded the palace since 1523 and the changing of the guard takes place every day between the 23rd of April and the 31st of August at 12.15pm or Sundays at 1.15pm. The ceremony lasts for about 40 minutes and it's in the main courtyard of the palace. They do the ceremony off season as well but the times vary according to the day of the week so I just recommend checking online before visiting. Here is the Royal Palace. So Sweden does have a constitutional monarchy. The current king is King Carl Gustav and his daughter, Crown Princess Victoria, will take the throne after him. The palace has different Baroque and Renaissance style features that you can see here on the building. 
and it does have many different museums that are open to the public including the Three Crown Museum where you go into the oldest part uh, you can still see walls from the original castle they also have the Royal Armoury here and you can visit some of the apartment buildings and the Royal Chapel the part where we are is the Royal Gift Shop of course Royals they gotta make some money too <laughs> so you can get some souvenirs uh, right here when Carl Gustav and his wife Queen Sylvia come out to wave to the people, they do so on that balcony right there. All of the figures on this side of the building are supposed to represent the power of man, in particular the king. So all of the tops here, these are different noble figures, noble male figures. And then all the women also represent somehow the strength of man. So we'll make our way into the big royal courtyard which is where we'll finish this obelisk was put up here to commemorate a victory that sweden had over a war with russia as you can see the obelisk is quite new uh, it was taken down and rebuilt in 2020 because it was weather damaged it is not from egypt nothing at all it is a granite obelisk that was made in sweden the orange building that you'll see just behind the garbage truck is the Finnish church that we saw from the back. And now we'll finish here on the main square overlooking a statue of King Karl Johan, who was the Swedish king in the early 19th century. He was originally a French admiral called Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte, um, but the king in Sweden had no heir. This was during the Napoleonic Wars, so Jean-Baptiste was offered the chance to become the king of Sweden provided he helps Sweden to victory. Jean-Baptiste said, I'll do it, but only if you give me Norway as a prize. So Sweden went to victory and Norway became part of Sweden, which lasted from 1814 until 1905. He eventually became the King of Sweden and changed his name to King Karl Johan. And here you can see the Royal Palace. So this is where we'll end the soft guided walking tour of historic Stockholm and especially Gamlestan. I hope you enjoyed this tour and maybe you'll get to visit someday soon. And as you can see, it's a beautiful walkable city, no matter the time of year, no matter the weather. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Emma Vesterheim. You can follow me via the links in the description. My company website is thehiddennorth.com. If you want a walking tour of Bergen, Norway, you can find me at ilovebergen.net. You can also buy me a coffee or leave me a tip via PayPal via the links in the descriptions. If you want to follow me on Facebook or Instagram, my handle is Emma in the North. All one word, Emma in the North. I have a Facebook group where I provide travel tips for all of the Nordics. And on Instagram, I give you a little insight into what it's like to be a tour leader through all of the Nordic countries. Thank you so much for watching. Maybe I'll see you here in Stockholm one day.